bringing hope to many around the globe, transforming lives into legacies. Live in Word with Pastor Mensah Otterville. And now, today's word. So, God is sitting in judgment against sinners. In God's court, there is the prosecution. Those who are bringing a case against the sinner before God. And the prosecution has three witnesses. The first is the law. The law. In John chapter 5 verse 45, Jesus says, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses in whom you trust. Now Moses is, re represents the law. Jesus says, I am not an accuser. When you stand before God and God is judging you, God uses the law to witness against you. The law or the law of Moses or what we call the Mosaic law is a witness against us. So when we read the law, we see, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, don't do this, don't do that, and we've done all of that. That law is now coming against us. So in God's tribunal, there is the accused, and there is the law accusing us. Not only does the law accuse us, conscience also accuses us. Romans chapter 2 verse 15. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts. They are conscious also bearing witness. And between themselves they are thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So our conscience also accuses us. You know the, the thing about law is that the law only catches you when it catches you. So if you, if you break the law and nobody catches you, you cannot be brought before a court. The only way you can be accused is when the law catches you and uh, you are caught. But sometimes when the law catches you and nobody catches you, your conscience catches you. So when we stand before God, not only is the law accusing us, our conscience is also accusing us. So what you did in secret that nobody saw, your conscience tells you you did it. So in the prosecution, the law is against you, your conscience is against you, and then there is a third very, very serious prosecution witness, Satan. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God. The power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has accused. Who has accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So there are three accusers. The law is an accuser. Your conscience is an accuser. And Satan is an accuser. Satan has a case against all of us. And what is his case? His case is very simple. God, you say you are just. When I sinned with the angels, you cast me out and condemned me. These have sinned. If you must be just, you must treat them as you treated me. That is his case. Simple case. So when we stand before God, the law is saying you have disobeyed God. Your conscience is saying you have disobeyed God. And Satan is saying you have also disobeyed God. And not only that, he is the one who instigated your disobedience. So he has a file of your record. He says, Father, I'm the one who told him to go and do that. I, I told him to do that. And he did that. And I suggested he should go and take that man. And he did. And I said he should take that woman. And he did. This is his charge sheet. I investigated it. I instigated it. And this is the proof. How can man be free and be justified before God in this law court? When God is just, he must up uphold his law. Our conscience is accusing us. And now the chief prosecutor. Satan says. I, if you want. If you want proof. I can give you proof. 
things that nobody saw, I made him do it. And if you are just, then he has to be punished. So how do we escape condemnation under such accusation? What has man got in his defense for God to justify him? Only one, our advocate. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the advocate. First John chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, have you? <laughs> If anyone says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for our ours only, but also for that of the whole world. Jesus is an interesting advocate. He does not just represent us, he actually takes our place. So the law is accusing you. Your conscience is accusing you. Satan is accusing you. The only one who can defend you is Jesus. And you cannot defend yourself because you know in your conscience you've done it. The evidence of the law, you've done it. And now the bad boy also says, I did bad with you. You can't run away from it. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 15 says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. So how does God justify the sinner without committing an abomination? If God is going to justify us, how does he do that? Without committing an abomination. And he does that. If God is going to justify a man. Then the condition of sin in man has to be paid for. If sin has not been paid for. Then justification cannot take place. So Romans chapter 4 verse 23 and 25 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who was raised up, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now verse 25, that's where I'm landing. Who was delivered up for our offenses. And he was raised because of our justification. Two things I want you to note there. That Jesus was delivered for our offenses. What does that mean? Through his death, he was offered as the substitute, as the propitiation for our offenses. We know that already. I don't want to belabor that. And then he was raised for our justification. His resurrection is what brought justification. That's very important. Without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no justification. His death was important. His death, his suffering took away our sins. But if Jesus had died and had not resurrected, he would have paid for our sins, but we couldn't be justified. That's what the Bible is saying. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. If Jesus had died, he would have died for our sins. But if he had not resurrected, there will be no evidence to justify us. How does that happen? I'll just use a little illustration just to help you understand why he had to pay the debt. And not only that, he had to resurrect so he can present evidence at court that this man who is being accused 
the law accuses him, conscience accuses him, Satan accuses him, but everything he's been accused of has been paid for. And that is the job of Jesus Christ, our defense attorney, to ensure that all the charges against us can be dropped so that the judge can pronounce us not guilty, free. And when he says that, he must be just when he says that. He cannot be unjust when he frees us. So just imagine this. A man, we can call him Mr. F.T. Adams. Mr. F.T. Adams leaves a huge debt for his children. His children grow up and they realize that their father left a huge debt for them. So the creditor comes and the creditor is calling for all the debt owed. That means that soon, if they are not able to pay for the debt that their father left them, they will lose everything that I have. Mr. F.T. Adams children will lose everything the children live in ghana they are ghanaians because mr adams is a ghanaian but the person whom they owe the money to doesn't live in ghana he lives in the uk of all places so as the debt mounts the creditor takes the case to court secures a judgment whatever the judgment is against the children on the verge of losing everything, Mr. F.T. Adams' twin brother, L.T. Adams, comes to their rescue. He has no children. And he says, this is my twin brother's children. He left a debt for them. They couldn't pay. They are in trouble. The court is about to declare something against them. I need to help them. I have no children of my own. So this second Adam sells everything he has, all his assets, leaves everything he has, sells them, and decides I have to go and rescue my brother's children. So he goes, takes all the money he has, goes to the UK and goes to pay all the debt. And after he pays and settles all the debt, he collects a receipt, a signed receipt to show that the debt is paid. So at that time, he has finished one side. He has paid the debt, but there's no record of it in the court. So granting that after he had paid the debt, he has the receipt, he has the evidence, but he dies. And everything is gone. The price is paid. The receipt he had. He did all the work, but the court has no evidence that the price has been paid. So the children lose everything. That is what would have happened if Jesus had died and not resurrected. When he died, he paid for all our sins. But we had not been justified. Because there is no evidence of that before God's tribunal. So what did Jesus do? He paid for all the sins. And he died. Then he rose again. And when he rose again, he took the evidence of what he has done. He told his disciples, don't hold on to me now. I have to go and present evidence. So he goes to present evidence. He says, Mr. Judge, I went and paid the price that was required for the case to be dropped. And now, here is the evidence. On the basis of that, God Almighty the judge, 
receives the document of every debt that has been paid. And on the basis of that, he tells the children, he tells us who are in court, you are discharged. You are now justified. Has God been just? Yes. Did we owe? Yes. Were we sinners? Yes. Were we deserving of death? Yes. Did the Lord judge us? Yes. Did our conscience judge us? Yes. Did Satan judge us? Yes. But what is the judgment? It's been paid for. It's been paid for. So on the resurrection of Jesus... That is why the Bible says without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. Because there will only be suffering for our sins, but no justification. But Christ rose again and presented the evidence. And in God's court, we were pronounced not guilty. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in the final judgment, when we stand before God, where the final judgment is determined, when God decides to judge, he is going to take this evidence. And listen to how the passage says it. That he did that for all who believed in him. When we stand before God, we don't say, Father, God, I try to be good. I try to do nice things. There's no justification for you. If you, you, were, you commit murder... And from after you commit murder, you become the nicest person. It's good that you have changed and become a nice person, but the murder still stands. You can't say, Lord, I try to do good. No, no, no. When we come, we stand by our lawyer, Jesus Christ. And we say, Father, this is the evidence by which I'm admitted into your presence. This man paid for everything I owed and on the basis of that I don't go to hell I go to heaven not because of my righteous deeds but because the price has been paid so our justification here on earth ends up in our final justification at the judgment seat of the Lord when he the righteous judge looks upon the sacrifice of his son Jesus and he says whoever believes in Jesus is passed from death unto life that is why when you trust your own works for salvation you have no salvation when you trust your church for salvation there is no salvation you trust men suitable for salvation I am looking for a lawyer myself I'm looking for the advocate. Why do you want to come and see me? See the lawyer. You don't go to a man of God for salvation. You don't go to a church for salvation. You go to Jesus Christ. Who himself is the propitiation for our sins. In Christ Jesus, we have passed from death unto life. From condemnation to justification and that my friends is what it means when the Bible says we have been justified God has made a proclamation in the universe these people are not guilty because they have placed their faith in Christ Jesus who died for them and rose again to present the evidence before me Amen. Thank you for listening to Living Word. To interact with Pastor Mensah Otebe, like his page on Facebook. 
follow him on Twitter at Mensa Otterville. Email Otterville at centralgospel.com or call plus 233 302 688 000.